had a couple of yeah, study. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, welcome uh, to week four. We're halfway done. Uh, I haven't scared anybody off yet, so that's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's open the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of faith. And today, as we study the Apostles' Creed, we give you thanks for our confession of faith in you, of the mighty works that you have done for us in salvation. So we ask that you be with us as we uh, look into that and dig into that a little bit and learn more about uh, why we say what we say when we say our confession of faith and when we say the creeds uh, in order to better know you and more glorify the work that you have done in our lives so that we can share that work with others. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week we did the Ten Commandments. Are there any questions about any of that after kind of thinking about it for a little while, or maybe you haven't thought about it since you left the class, I don't know, um, but I gave you a handout, so I want to encourage you, there's a lot of scripture references in here, and this one uh, today, there's a few appendices, appendices in the back that have some extra information, um, we're not going to go through all of this, we don't have time to do it in class, but I would encourage you to, to read through some of those and look at those, especially if you're curious about something that we say in our confession of faith, and you're wondering, where is that in the Bible? There's a lot of scripture references here for you to do that. Okay. And I also, I ordered, do you guys want the one of the catechism? Yeah. It's been ordered and it has not yet arrived. So as soon as it is, I will let you know and we'll be here next week. Or if you are super excited and you want to come get it during the week, we can arrange that. Um, but most people don't get excited about those books. But anyway. Okay. So. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the Apostles' Creed? Wow. <laughs> Insightful. Well, I believe, you know, it, All right. it says I believe. over and over. Right, so... <laughs> Your handout, maybe your working head gave you a nice second. I there. did not. <laughs> um, what does the word creed mean? It means I believe. It comes from the Latin word credo. So a creed is a statement of belief, right? So we are saying Whatever comes after this is what we confess to be true. Right? Now, if we before we kind of really dig into the details, if you look at the Apostles' Creed, is it really big or really specific? It's specific, right? Especially that paragraph about who? Jesus, right? God the Father gets the he gets, I mean, he has the big job of creating the heavens and the earth, but he gets like two lines. And then Jesus gets a whole paragraph, right? Because a lot of the particulars of our faith are about the person of Jesus. So we have a very specific uh, confession here, which is important, right? Because if you were to say, I believe there's a God, and that God created the, the universe and everything in it, does that mean you're a Christian? No, it doesn't, right? means you're a theist, you believe in a God, right? Um, you may not know anything about that God. You may believe that God was the, the, one of the postulations is the watchmaker God where he just made everything and wound it up and then left and he doesn't pay attention to it anymore. Right? And he's off creating other things. Um, so when we say our creed, we're specifically identifying our belief, not only in a God, but the particularities of that God and what he does, right? Um, so, uh, let's look in our Bibles at Deuteronomy 6.4. If you don't have one, you can use your phone. And if you don't have one on your phone, I'd recommend downloading one on your phone. They're really useful. Um, if not, then I'll read it. You can just listen. It's meant to be heard anyways, so. Can I use one of those? Yeah. Oh, there's a little, that's like a smorgasbord of a bunch of different ones. But. Okay. 
So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Okay? So that was the Old Testament confession of faith. Was um, It's often called the great Shema. So the, the Shema comes from the Hebrew word for um, hear or listen. Um, so this is their great declaration. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? Um, and the, the fact that the God, God is the Lord is one is what's distinguishing them from all their pagan neighbors, right? They, they don't believe in a bunch of different gods for the seasons and for fortune and for different particular blessings, but there's one God. Okay? So that's kind of like the earliest form of a creed that we have in the scriptures is this statement from the Old Testament Israelites. Now hop into the New Testament, Romans chapter 10. verse 9 and 10 of chapter 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So there's a, in scripture, there is this element of, of genuine faith leading to you speaking your faith. Um, that faith is uh, in the Old Testament, there's the imagery of like it, it's burning in your bones. Like it, uh, when you have faith, it's not something that you can keep to yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who becomes a Christian goes out and blabs about it constantly everywhere they go, like just to random people they see. But when you deeply care about somebody, if this is your genuine faith, then you usually incorporate your faith into the way you speak. To them, right? uh, and that's one of the examples of what this is talking. Uh, that the, the, uh, you're justified in the faith in your heart that God gives you, right? Um, but uh, you confess it as well, because uh, it's by its nature, it's not meant to be contained. Um, and really, I think Americans in particular, we have a hard time linking this idea with our day-to-day -day actions. But like, I want you to think about what are some things that you currently do that if you were not a Christian with faith in God, you would not do that are the equivalent of a vocal confession of faith in Jesus. Huh? If you didn't believe in Jesus, you wouldn't sin? Oh, no. I put that all turned off. Oh, you're good. Okay. <laughs> go to church? If you wouldn't go to church, yeah, you wouldn't be here. All right? If you didn't believe in God and Jesus, why would you be here? All right? And do many people in your life know that on Sunday morning, this is where you are? Yeah, right. That's part of that confession that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, right? Um, and it, fortunately, in our country, we're able to worship publicly without, you know, legal harassment, at least, right? Um, in some countries, they're not. And so part of their public confession isn't they go around yelling at people about how they're Christian, but that they risk life and limb to gather and worship with him, right? And that that speaks very loudly, right? So the Christian church is pretty well, well documented throughout history of, as having massive growth rates in areas where it's trying to be viciously stamped out. So even today, that's true. The, the fastest growing churches in the world are in, in Afghanistan and Iran, where it's a, like, it's punishable by death to be you known as a worshiper of Christ. <clears throat> so, um, so I wanted to, mention that so that you don't think that confession is just like you stopping a random stranger in the, in the grocery store and say, do you know about Jesus? He's my Lord and Savior. Um, that it comes out, God has designed it so that it comes out quite naturally in ways that is much more receptive to people. Um, and most especially you see this in, the, in your relationship with your own family. Right? The way you treat your family um, vocally and otherwise is very shaped by your faith in Christ. And they know that. Right? They may not accept it, but they know it, right? Um, 
And so that's a, that's part of the witness that you bear. Okay, letter B on the handout, the three ecumenical creeds. Um, so these ecumenical basically means like widely regarded among Christians. Um, so these are the creeds that the, like the vast, vast majority of Christians subscribe to in the Christian faith, even if they're of different denominations. Uh, and the first one, of course, is the apostles or baptismal creed. So although it did not reach its final form until the 8th century, its basic structure and content existed in creedal form from as early as the 2nd century. And it's a summary of the doctrine of the apostles. Um, and I'll just look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And if you, if you want to sort of, like if you're looking for a place in the Bible to learn about sort of the life of early Christians and how, how similar or dissimilar it is to us, the book of Acts is a good place to find that. Um, so Acts 2, verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Right, so there's already in Acts chapter two here, and this is soon after Pentecost, this understanding of there's sort of a unified teaching in the church, right? They've dedicated themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship, right? Um, and so the exact wording that we use did not become the official apostles creed until the eighth century, but the confession of what the apostles creed says has been going on from the very beginning of the Christian church. And my general bent with that, if, with the creeds and really anything in the church, if there's something the church has been doing that has spanned empires and cultures, you should be very careful about messing with it because there's a reason it's still around. Because right? um, a lot of times, human cultures, we tend to think that we're the smartest and most enlightened group that's come along. And so we think we've got really great reasons for getting rid of stuff like that, trying something new. And I typically caution that. You have very good reason if something's been around for that long, that there's a reason it's still there. Um, the Nicene Creed is the second one, and that's one uh, here you'll see when we celebrate communion is when we typically say the Nicene Creed, and that's kind of the, the custom in the church uh, historically. Um, it was formulated by the leaders of the church in the fourth century at the town of Nicaea, so that's where the name comes from, Nicene Creed, uh, and it was drawn up at the first ecumenical council in 325 AD, to counter the heretical teachings of Arius, who taught that Jesus was less than true God, okay? So Arius was a Christian, but taught what became to be believed by the consensus of the church to be a heretical teaching about Jesus, that he was just a man, uh, not fully God, right? Um, and so you'll, now that you know that, the next time you say the Nicene Creed, you'll be able to kind of pick up why the wording is worded the way it is because it's addressing this particular thing. I think I, I have it in here. But it's like, um, they talk about Jesus being true God, um, begotten of his father from eternity, right? That's in Luther's explanation. Uh, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, all that kind of language, right? Uh, is because it's speaking directly to the idea that Jesus is not fully God. And so that's why the wording is the way it is. Um, and the reason that that became the custom for us to say that on communion Sundays is because that's where we're acknowledging that Christ, through his divinity, is working salvation in us through the gift of the body and blood that he sacrificed on the cross. <clears throat> uh, then the third is the Athanasian Creed. I'll write that up there. Athanasian. <coughs> This is the super duper long one. It's like almost two full pages. Um, and we say it, um, does anybody know when we say it? Well, it says right here. What does it say? <laughs> Sunday after Pentecost. Yeah, oh. and do we know there's a name for that Sunday, another name for it. Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday. So this is, so what do you think the Athanasian Creed is about? <laughs> it's about the Trinity, right? Which is why the language is so elaborate and confusing, because can we fully explain the Trinity? No, what the Athanasian Creed is doing is expressing our faith in something that doesn't make logical sense, right? It's expressing our faith that we believe that while God is present in three distinct persons in the scriptural account, he is still yet one God, and each one is still fully themselves. 
I have no idea how that works. If you ask me, I'll be honest. He didn't say, don't know. But his word says it, and I'll wager he knows more about himself than I do. So, um, so that one, we always say once a year on, on Trinity Sunday, because it's our expression that we're Trinitarian. Now there's, then, and there have been groups within Christ, the Christian faith throughout history that have rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. And so this, is, this was a creed that was established by the, like the, the church as a whole, apart from those groups to establish this, this doctrine, this teaching. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so while some people will say that doing these is sort of like, you know, there are a lot of churches now, they don't have you say a creed every Sunday. Right? They may do it once a month, or they may do it when they celebrate communion, because some churches only celebrate communion four times a year, and then they'll do the creeds and all this stuff. Um, so why do you think we say them every week? Is it just just because? Because what we've always done? Partly. Partly? <laughs> to be fair, it's because we need to be reminded. Maybe. Reminded we of might one. forget. Yeah. And so when you go out into the world, is it a is it a neutral, safe territory for your faith? No, it's not, right? The, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh are constantly trying to draw us away from what God would have us do and believe and know. So one of the things that Jesus says when he sends his Holy Spirit, when he's going to send his Holy Spirit to his disciples, he says that the Holy Spirit will give you remembrance of the things that I've said to you. Right? And so one of the ways that we express that out in the life of the church is this constant being on guard against potential false teachings and being led astray. And one of the ways we do that is by repeating the things that we have been taught a lot. Um, <clears throat> because imagine, uh, or maybe you, you've had a period in your life when you haven't gone to church for a long time. And it, it can kind of sneak up on you, can't it? Right? You'll, you'll all of a sudden you'll be like, well, I haven't been in six months. Right, and it was it was originally just going to be like I'll take a break for a little bit. We're gonna go, we're gonna try and figure out. You know, we didn't really like the church we're at. Maybe we're gonna figure out a new place. And then the gap between those times is like much longer than we planned. Right. Um, so the idea is, and the scriptures tell us this: the devil behaves like a prowling predator. Right. He's a lion seeking to devour us. And so one of the ways in which we guard ourselves is through God's word and through our confession of faith in it. And we, were, we want to be as particular as we can in order to guard our hearts from being led astray. So some of it is tradition, but tradition is worthwhile when the reason it's rooted in is sound. If the only reason you're doing something is, well, we've always done it that way. If you've ever had children, you know that that doesn't work for them. And then, they're no longer a three-year-old just going, why, why, why? They're a 12-year-old going, why? And then that answer is really not, not enough. Um, any questions about those three? Okay, so in the, uh, on YouTube, we've got the videos up from my spring Bible study, and there's, there's three or four sessions on the creed, the Apostles' Creed in particular. So if you want to dig in a little bit more there, you can watch those um because there's a lot to the creeds I, I remember when i took the class at the seminary on on the creeds it was super fascinating to me because they're essentially built over the span of centuries to address issues that rose in the church and so then after that every time i would read the creed it was no longer this dead paragraph that i've said every week but it was like i could see where and why things were put in there uh, okay so what does it mean to say, I believed, or I believe? Um, we are not saved merely by believing, but by faith in God. Faith's object is always God as he gives himself to us in his word. There are three dimensions to the opening line of the creed, I believe. Knowledge, assent, and trust. So we're going to actually read these passages, and I'm going to have us look them up separately so they don't take as long. I will do James. Does somebody want to look up 1 Corinthians 8, 5, and 6? Sure. Well, just got that one. And then Psalm 31, 14. Does anyone want to do that one? Okay. 
Start. Okay. And then the Hebrews 11, 1 to 3. Chris, you got that? All right, here's James 2, 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Right, so um, the demons also believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? He does, there's some instances where he prevents them from speaking about who he is because they want to call him who he is, the Son of God, right? So they believe who he is. Um, so, but there's, there's a difference here. Okay, uh, the first Corinthians. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and even though there are many of these gods and lords, yet there is for us only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things and for him. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created, through whom we live. Nope, I think five and six, right? Yeah. Um, very good, right? So uh, it's more than just knowing who God is. And this is distinguishing between believing and belief. Okay. So what happens if uh, tomorrow some super powerful humanoid being comes down from the sky and he can do amazing things like Superman? Do we now all of a sudden stop believing in Jesus because, well, look, there's a Superman here. Right. What this is saying is even if these other gods were real, what our faith is in is that they are not God in the sense that the one God is, and there's only one Lord, Jesus, right? So they're all reflections or shadows of the true God. And that's built into when you say, I believe, when you make this confession, is you're not just saying that you believe that God is powerful and can do amazing things, but that he is the one who's done these particular things and responsible for, like, the great work in creation and redemption. Uh, Psalm 31, 14. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. All right. So faith is trust. So uh, a good way to do this is, let's say, um, do I believe, do you believe that your mom is your mom? Yeah, right? Okay. Is that the same as trusting your mom? No, right? There's a difference, right? So you can believe your mom is your mom. But then when she says, trust me, you could also, while still believing she is who she says she is, is that you don't trust her. So that's what this is talking about here, is that part of our faith is trust in God. So it isn't just acknowledging who he is and what he's done, but believing in him as, as he is. And that faith is trust. All right, and then Hebrews 11, first. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their condemnation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. All right. So, um, so part of an element of our faith, and this is something that I really struggle with as a young person, and I think culturally in the West we do because we're very rationally, logically oriented, is that if we can't see it, smell it, cut it up, measure it, experiment on it, we have a hard time believing. Uh, and there are lots of aspects of God, Luther, Luther termed this the hidden God, that he, when he does things, that we don't know why he does them. But if we're being intellectually and philosophically honest, and we are a person of faith, does the fact that God is greater than we can imagine elicit a sense of fear or a sense of comfort? To me, it elicits a sense of comfort. Because if I could fully understand God as one of his creatures, he's not very impressive. Right? Just as if your kids, when they're two years old, could fully understand all things about life that you're trying to teach them. All of life's not very impressive, right? But the reality is that when your kids are two and you're trying to teach them about things, they don't understand why you're doing what you're doing and what the reason behind it is. Right? And it's the same in our relationship with God. There are lots of things that he does and things that he gives us and tells us that we don't fully understand. Right? Um, and so as a part of faith is we still trust in him despite those things. C.S. Lewis uses kind of a funny image that uh, to this. He says, uh, when you're on a train and it goes into a tunnel and you can't see anything around you, 
the reaction isn't to jump off the train. It's to trust in the conductor, right? So even though everything around you has disappeared and you don't know what's happening, you're trusting that the person who's driving the train isn't leading you off the cliff or into a wall or something. Uh, and that's sort of the element that's expressed here. Any questions about that? All right, <clears throat> page two, confessing the name of God. So God introduces himself, reveals and reveals his name in the Old Testament. So this is in Exodus chapter three. Uh, in Exodus chapter three is the burning bush chapter. Um, and I'll just read this for you real quick. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Right. And so what Moses is doing here is God has called him to do something and he doesn't really want to go. So he's trying to come up with a little excuse. You know, well, yeah, but what if I go and they ask me your name is like, what am I supposed to tell him? And then because he's probably thinking God's not going to tell me his name. And then God tells him his name. He says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Right. So um, I am in English is the name of God in Hebrew or we can transliterate the Hebrew first. That's where we get Yahweh, right? And in Hebrew, it's written like this. So if you look in the original Old Testament, that's what the name of God looks like. Now, in ancient, uh, in the ancient world with the Israelites, you are only allowed to write the name of God. You're not allowed to say it. And so that's how holy God's name is. So this is an important distinction that God has now made. He says, I am who I am. And if you have you've studied any languages, you know what's sort of the sort of primary and first verb you learn in any language to be, right? You're always learning the verb to be because it's like the primary aspect of the way that we communicate. And I don't think that's accident. It's reflective of the nature of our creator. All right, so his name revealed to Moses as I am, or you could say I am who I am, right? In other words, like I'm the root and seat of being. That's me. Okay, um, and then if we look at Exodus 4, and this will be, an, this is an important distinction to make in your English translations of the Bible. In Exodus 4, 11 to 13. So then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, who made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be your mouth and teach you what you will speak. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. So in your English translations, if you have those in front of you, you notice that in verse 11, the two times Lord is mentioned, all four letters are capitalized. And then you'll notice in verse 13 that only the L in Lord is capitalized. Hmm. Anybody know why that is the case? So when, when you see in your English translations the word Lord and all letters are capitalized, that is Yahweh. And when you see Lord and it's just the first letter, it's the title of Lord, which is um, in, in Hebrew translated as Adonai. So when, when Moses is speaking his question back to God, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, oh, my Yahweh, he's, he's applying the title of Lord. But here, when the Lord is speaking to him, he said, when it's describing the narrative of God, and they're referring to him, you can say, then Yahweh said to him, who has made man's mouth, who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind, is it not I, Yahweh? Right. Um, so now when you're reading your English, you know, this is, there's a couple other words that are, that are used to refer to lowercase Lord, but that's the distinction there. So now I want you to turn to Numbers chapter six. And I want to point this out because this will be quite familiar to you. In fact, you just heard it. And I think it will enhance the meaning if you didn't already know it. So looking at verses 22 to 27. So Numbers chapter 6. Verse 
So Numbers is the is after. So you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. All right, and this verse is 22 to 27. This is Aaron's blessing. And the Lord, so and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to him, them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Does that sound familiar? Right. So that's actually why we conclude our service that way is it's the application of God's actual name upon you as his people. Right. Um, and so uh, we aren't when we say the Lord there, we're actually referring to the name of God. We're not referring to his title. Um, and that's where that piece of our liturgy comes from in the scriptures. <clears throat> and that's a big deal because that's the that's, you know, we said you can't speak. The name of God, well, God is now giving his name to be spoken for the purpose of blessing his people. Right? And he still does that today. Okay. Um, so, what is God's personal name revealed in the New Testament? This one's easy. That's not your question. Who's God revealed as person by a personal name in, in the New Testament? Jesus. Yep. Okay. And Jesus means God saves. God saves. All right, so that kind of sets up sort of the purpose and place of a creed. Um, and when you're saying the creed now, you know that when you say you're believing in God, you're invoking his name, right? As you're saying, not just like God title, but like God, the God, Lord. Lord. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the Apostles' Creed is divided up into three articles. There's the first, second, and third articles. And each one has a primary action and a primary person. Okay. So in the first one, the first article is just the sentence, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So if you were to say in that one sentence, who is the primary person being referred to and who's the primary, what's the primary action being done? God the creator. Okay, so creation is the primary action. And who's the primary person? God the Father. All right, then we get to the second article, um, and we'll, we'll just kind of skip ahead for this portion of things. It's not in the handout yet. Um, the second article is has an action and a person as well. So we pro you probably know the person. This is a long paragraph. Jesus, Jesus right? So God the Son. Jesus. And what's the action? Crucifixion. Hmm? The crucifixion. The crucifixion. But there's more in there. So the crucifixion is part of a greater action that God is doing through Jesus. And we have a term. Redeem. So redemption would be the work, right? The action. So crucifixion is the high point of redemption. But we also talk about him being born, you know, him dying, him suffering, and then him rising again. Right? So all that is the work of redemption and then the third is what is the action and then the person of the third so if we've got god the father and god the son who are we missing spirit. Huh? Holy spirit. yeah god is the holy spirit right and what does the holy spirit do in the last part of the apostles So we've been created, we fell into sin, we've been redeemed. So now what's what do we do? What's being done? Sanctification. Yeah, sanctification, right? Um, so 
I'm just giving you an overview. We'll go over each of the articles in detail here because we're only doing the first two today and we'll finish with the third next week. Um, but sanctification, um, if something is being sanctified, what's happening to it? Being made holy, right? And so the Holy Spirit's work is we're being made holy, we're remaining holy. So sanctification is like the living out of the Christian life, right? So you were created, you fell into sin, you've been redeemed, and now you are being made holy, um, set apart for God, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the easy definition I give for the work of the Holy Spirit for my junior high compromise is the Holy Spirit's job is to give us the Jesus stuff. Um, so this is the Jesus stuff, the redemption, and the Holy Spirit's job is to bring that stuff to us. And so that's why we say the Holy Spirit is responsible for the creation of faith. Um, so, right, so, and we, we went, we went uh, through some of the differences between knowledge and assent and belief, right? So, theoretically, one could have the knowledge and the belief that Jesus was true God and true man and died on the cross 2,000 years ago to save the world from their sins, and they could believe that that doesn't apply to them. And people do this all the time. Well, I'm not, I'm not a good enough person, or I've really done some terrible things. There's no way that, that, I, that God did that for me. Uh, and the Holy Spirit's job is to say, uh, no, it's for you. Okay. So that's why we say that. That's why the words of institution say that. That's why when you receive communion, you hear the words for you. Right? Take, eat the body of Christ given for you. Right. So while communion is a public confession of faith that you're sharing with fellow believers in the congregation you occupy, there's also the individual component of God specifically giving this to you. Um, and so that's what the Holy Spirit does, and that's how we, we are made holy, is that the knowledge of God and the work that he's done in Christ is being applied to you specifically. Okay, so let's just read through at the bottom of page 13 on your handout um, the first article's meaning. Okay, so this, uh, this is from the catechism here. So what does this mean question, and here's what Luther says. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. Uh, underline the word still there. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily, underline daily, provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. So uh, if you were to summarize first <laughs> paragraph there, what is it talking about? Mm -hmm. specifically of, of, Me. of you right so first paragraph is that you and your body and soul right eyes ears and all my members my reason and all my senses and still takes care of them, right? the second paragraph what's the second paragraph about yeah your belongings right so so god provides and takes care of you and creates you not only you but also the things that he gives to you right so uh, so this is actually kind of nice and in line with our stewardship focus right now in October, right? Is our recognition that all of these things, including our body and soul and all the things that make us who we are, are from God, right? Uh, and then the last part is that this is something that he is doing, right? So he defends and guards and protects. And then, then the last part, Luther's emphasis on the fact that he's doing this of his own will and volition out of love, not because we earned it or we deserve it or anything like that. Um, and because he has done that, now our task is to give thanks and praise to him. Right? Okay. Um, so this this next section here, where I'm just going to kind of skip over, um, just mention briefly, God is our Father, God is Almighty. There's a bunch of scripture references there that you can look up where those teachings come from. Um, and those are the scriptural basis for 
the formulation of the creed and the way that it's expressed here in the first article. Um, we're going to skip down to letter C. So I'd encourage you to read those, those, those uh, scriptures. <laughs> Um, God is maker of heaven and earth. So the sacred scripture rejects three ways of viewing creation. Um, the first, materialism, and that is that creation is the product of evolutionary chance. Now, that's a little simplistic. The other aspect of materialism, so if you're going to postulate any sort of like sound or viable theory about the creation of things, there has to be something eternal. Okay. Um, and in materialism, the eternal thing is right in the name. It's matter. So the postulation of materialism is that matter has just always in some form been here. Okay. Now, from our standpoint, sort of philosophically, if you're looking at the philosophy of religion, that then means that in materialism, what is the God? It is matter, right? That's the eternal thing. Now, you don't ascribe to it intention and will. Which is why, if matters the original thing that's always been there, how do you explain the presence of human beings? Well, it's just over a really long, long period of time, the manifestation of chance and interaction of that matter with other matter, and then eventually you get to us. Right? That's sort of the, the summary of materials. Right? Uh, what does that not answer? Of where the matter came from in the first place. Okay, so you've got to ask, well, where did this come from? And I will say that that's an effective strategy because most people who are materialists don't actually think matter is eternal. They haven't really thought about the eternal concept. So usually they'll say, oh, well, there were a bunch of gases. And you can say, well, where did those come from? Well, those were little particles that formed gases. Okay, well, where are the particles? So you can always go back and back and back. If you have somebody who says, well, matters has always been there. Now it's not a faith for science. It's a faith in faith. Right, they're taking on faith that matters has always been there. There's no way to prove that or disprove it. Right? So, but science primarily answers the question of what and how. Those are the two things science is concerned with, right? Like, what is this thing and how does it work? Science does not answer the question of why. So, for example, if you're a materialist and somebody asks you, why are we here? What will your answer be? Yeah, they just happen to be here. Okay. I don't know about you, but that's pretty depressing. Like, because then, if that's the answer to the question of why, do you have a purpose? <clears throat> no. What happens when you die? You die. You go back into the eternal matter. Right? Now, that's why they usually try to pair some, some form of reincarnation with this idea. Because you're, you break down into other <coughs> matter, and then it gets reformed and reborn in some other form or whatever. Um, but it's really... From our, our perspective, it's really an insufficient explanation for creation and, and life and, and what, we, what we've observed and experienced. Uh, so we reject that by saying this creed. We also reject pantheism. Does anybody know what pantheism is? So pantheism, in that blank there, you can write everything. So in the belief of pantheism, all things are God or all things are a part of, of God. So you and I are part of God. And then letter C, deism, God created initially, but does not pay attention to his creation or sustain it. So you put sustain it or pay attention. There. So that was sort of the watchmaker God hypothesis I shared with you earlier. That he got everything going, and then he's off to maybe creating a new universe and getting that going and creating another, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so the scriptures reject all three of those views. Um, because uh, we reject materialism for the reasons I gave you, we reject pantheism because we believe that we are created beings, which means by definition, we are not a part of God. The way the, how does the way the Bible speak 
reflect how we are related to God from the very beginning. What's the phrase it uses? We aren't made as a part of God, but we are made in the image of God, right? So we're a reflection <laughs> of the creator, but we're not part of him. Right? Um, and part of the reason for that, that we believe, is that God wanted us to have a relationship. And you can't have a relationship with yourself. Right? So um, his goal of, of creating creatures to, to serve and worship him that he can bless and that can be fruitful and multiply and reflect his glory is impossible if they're not actually separate creatures. Okay? So that's why we reject pantheism. And then deism, of course, is rejected. That's why I had you in the explanation underline the words still and daily. Is that we believe that God is active and present constantly in sustaining creation. So he didn't just start it off and let it go. He's not, we, we would say he's not even, he didn't start off and let it go. And now he just sits up on the moon and watches it. Right? So both him leaving and doing something else or him just sitting there and watching things happen, we reject. Right? We believe that he's actively involved. What's the, big, what's the biggest example of God being actively involved in creation? Yeah, Jesus. Right? If he wasn't actively involved in creation, then where the heck did Jesus come from? Why would he even bother? So the presence of Jesus throws the deism idea out the window. All right. So um, I think most of you are familiar with the creation narrative, but we'll just look at it real quick. Genesis chapter one. Um, there's a few key points I want to highlight. So uh, God. Letter A there under Genesis 1, 1 to 25, God creates out of nothing. Okay. Um, he creates out of nothing. So here's the setup for creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, some people are confused by the wording here because seems like the earth is already here is without form and void so essentially um, the idea is that like the there's matter present in verse two but implied in that statement is that god also created that he has yet to form it so a big theme in genesis one is going from the chaos at the beginning of creation to the order that god establishes right um and so the fact that in verse 2 it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. People, a lot of one object, objection people have is like, well, it says there's the earth there, there's waters. Where did those come from? And darkness, right? Well, so, well, God created those things, right? Um, so it's not like we're starting in with like a, you know, a vacuum here, um, that kind of thing. Um, but implied in this is that God created all of that stuff. So think of it as uh, like if you're if a construction company is putting a building together, what do they first do? They bring all the materials to the site. And if you look at all the materials before they start moving them and placing them in certain places, does it look like a house? Does it look like anything? It just piles of stuff, right? That's essentially what that that verse is set up with. This is setting up. Um, and then verse three is the big one here. And God said, let there be light and there was light okay um so god created light from nothing using only his word so that's letter b god creates by the power of his word okay now i think this is very cool because it's that very same word that declares you his child that declares you forgiven okay so that means that the very same word that can create things from nothing that is the source of all things is also the source of your faith and trust in the fact that you are what he says you are because he can make it so simply by speaking he has the authority to do that and so you can believe those promises when god says to you you are forgiven because his word creates that reality despite all the evidence that you have from knowing yourself internally that that's a okay all right um so I always like that connection. All right, letter C uh, in Genesis, the first day of creation. Here he says, and God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. 
So what is Jesus? What does God create there? Which designates what? There's time. some yeah time, right? So before God creates it, there, He's a being outside of time. That's what eternal means, right? And so He creates time not for Himself but for His creation, right? And so that's what's going on there in the first day. Right? He's creating time. And notice that the first, then you get your first designation of time. You get evening and morning, the first day. And it's actually interesting, the Hebrew word that Moses uses here when he wrote Genesis 1 is not first, but one. So it's one day one. Um, so he's establishing that this is like the first unit of a day that's ever been in all creation. Um, so he creates time. And... Uh, Letter D there, God creates with a voice. Now we we believe in um, a six literal six day seven day creation, um, and we believe that because the text seems to indicate it doesn't just say uh, this is the first day on its own. It says evening and morning. It specifically identifies it as an actual created day um, and because we believe that's part of the, the creation process the creation of time um, our basic stance on that is and, and with many other things is if you have to go through like an elaborate mental gymnastics to make sense of your theory about what the scriptures say that's probably not what it's saying um, and so we we say this is evening and morning the first day and it's because some people say, well, a day is like a thousand years to God. It's like, yeah, the Bible does say that, but it's saying here specifically evening and morning. So we don't apply that sort of um, is that simile. But, um, so we believe in that, but we, we don't have an official stance on the age of the earth, according <laughs> to science, because um, could God have created the earth in, in seven literal days? and made it appear to be ancient. Yeah, he's God, right? So the, the idea is that we're not super concerned about what scientists say the age of the earth is because the presence of God sort of renders the specificity of that sort of a moot point. And I think most of the time that's brought up as a means of like getting a, a one over on the other side, a got you sort of thing. Um, and we just say it's really not that significant. Does the earth have a definitive age? Yeah, it does. But knowing that is really not of huge consequence. Um, okay. We're on three here. I lost track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, three is angels are part of, are also part of God's creation. Um, even though they're not mentioned here. Um, so angels are part of God's creation and they serve a, a different purpose. Uh, and their purpose is to praise God and serve God, right? So humans are given some other tasks. We're meant to uh, have dominion over the earth. So having dominion is a part of our Imago Dei, our image of God charge. Um, that is not given to angels. Angels don't have dominion. Uh, and they're not given the task of caring for creation. Uh, and we are. Um, so uh, when you think angel, what's the name that comes to mind? Gabriel. Gabriel, right? What does Gabriel do? Oh, he proclaims. He proclaims. What is he proclaiming? That Jesus is here. And he's, he's God. He, like, the, how does he know that? God told him, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the, the Greek word for angel is angelos, and its meaning is messenger. So a lot of the instances of angels in the scriptures is they're sent by God with a message from him. Or the person he sends it to. So Gabriel is the is one of the most famous ones because he sent the message to Mary, 
And what does he tell Mary? Yeah. Right? And I still think it's one of the most incredible things in all the scriptures that Mary's response to that is, I'm your humble servant, let me do as, as you will. It's like, wow. Okay. <laughs> like, you just got told that you were going to have a baby by God. <laughs> Definitely an example to follow. Right. Um, so, uh, I like pointing that connection out because it helps make sense of the task. Now, angels have other functions, right? So there's also Michael. He's an <laughs> archangel, and archangels are described as the warrior angel cast. Um, there's a lot that is said in culture about angels that the scriptures does not say. Um, I thought about sharing this on our church's Facebook page. I had a friend who posted a funny picture of, like, if you read the description of angels, like in Ezekiel, for example, um, it, it all of a sudden now why they have to say do not fear makes way more sense because they are scary looking um, and so there's this little comic picture of like a like a being a blob like being that has like a ton of eyes like five six wings and like eight faces and and these little talk bubble says do not be afraid and the persons are like this is the scariest moment of my life <laughs> like, um and so, uh, so that that is part. Not all the angels look that way, but that there are those descriptions. Um, so then it makes more sense why they're always like, "Do not fear," because right? uh, they're pretty scary. All right, um, and we acknowledge this in the liturgy as we join them in the hymn they originally sung at the call of Isaiah. So therefore, the angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Thy glorious name, evermore praising Thee and saying. And then we do the song too, right? The holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth. Um, and Sabaoth is Hebrew for armies, great hosts. So like today when I said the prayers of the church, I said, uh, God, Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. So Sabaoth, that's what that means. Uh, power mm -hmm. and might. <clears throat> Heaven and earth are full of thy glory, right? So we're acknowledging um, the, that we are going to be alongside the angels in heaven. Uh, and we are alongside them in the church service as well, right? The church service is the joining of heaven and earth for the praise of God, right? So not only the angels are present singing his praises, but also our loved ones who have died in the faith and all those, uh, those Christians in faith are also joining together with us. And we're rather, we're joining together with them and singing the praises of God. All right, God is sustainer of his creation. Um, so we're not going to read these two references here, but I'll kind of sum them up for you. Uh, in Colossians 1, the theme there is that he holds all of creation together. And in uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, uh, what part does God give man in sustaining his creation? Right. So this is where he gives them dominion. He gives, specifically gives them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything that creeps along the ground. And if we... Fast forward to when Jesus is, is explaining lordship or dominion over others, what does he say is the proper execution of that? Is it saying, I'm in charge, therefore you must do X? Is that the exercise of dominion that God intends here? No, right? Um, the exercise that he intends is service in keeping, so taking care of is the dominion aspect so and that, that's an important distinction right because then we actually have a fair amount uh, of sympathies and commonalities with people who want to protect the environment we want to protect the environment too we've been given the task of taking care of it right um, now that doesn't mean that we equate like the death of a cow or a dog to the level of a human and it also doesn't mean that we're willing to kill humans in order to preserve trees right um, but our goal is to be responsible in the care of creation because we've been given dominion over it. That's part of our stewardship. Uh, that's been entrusted to our care collectively. So should should we as Christians care about the disappearing of the rainforest? Yeah, we should. Right? Um, now we don't let the, our concern for that become all consuming and then we stop caring about all these other things that the scripture asks us to care about as well because who is also part of creation? People. people are right i think sometimes it's sort of funny we and, and this comes up in fiction a lot i always think of the scene from the matrix when agent smith is like humans are a virus 
you know. Yeah. And so th there's this weird self-perception at times that we're like not a part of creation. So we're like this thing from outside of creation that's ruining it. Um, and not to say that sometimes we, we, do, we do ruin creation, um, but we're a part of it as well, right? So that just because you're concerned about creation doesn't mean then that you can um, sort of the, the danger of the humanistic argument is like for the greater good that you're willing to, to sacrifice all these people. Well, that's part of, that's part of creation, right? So you're not really liberating creation um, by harming humans because they're part of it. Um, okay, uh, letter E, what is the shape and direction of our lives in our father's creation? So Psalm 100 is service and praise. And then 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 is reception and prayer. So actually on Sunday, what is your primary job? When we, we're in the worship service, what's your primary job? Praising God, okay. That would not be the primary but that's what most people do. Mm -hmm. The primary job you have is receiving. Because God, the important parts of the worship service is not stuff that we're doing, but stuff that God is doing to and for us, right? So the important thing is to hear God's word. So you're receiving his word as a gift, right? So that's why we say, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, right? Um, and when we have the Lord's Supper, right? The primary act there is to you place your hands and you receive this gift. Right? And then what is the response to the reception of those things? Is the singing of praise and the offering of prayers and thanksgivings, right? Um, but if you had to choose one of those things being done in the worship service, you always want to choose the stuff that God's doing. That's the more important stuff, right? More important than the stuff that I'm doing, the stuff that, that you're doing in the pews, right, is the reception of these things, right? Um, so that's part of the shape and direction of our lives in line with our creator God. Okay, um, notice how Luther's explanation, which we read a little bit before, summarize what it means to have God as our creator and sustainer and for us to live in relation to him in this world. Um, so that's why Luther expands that out in language that's more relatable to people's lives. He says, you know, what this means is that like your body and your members, your senses, your reason, all that stuff comes from God. All of your, your shoes, your clothes, your house, etc. cetera. Uh, any questions about first art? It's not really a question, but I don't think I'd ever thought about this before. When you were reading the explanation, I didn't, I didn't notice before how many times the word all is in there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because the ultimate goal here of the, the first article of the creed is the recognition that everything is from God. Um, because that's the that's what we're sort of defending ourselves from being straight away from is, is being convinced that no, actually this is mine and I can do what I want with it. Right? Um, yeah. All right, second article. Um, let's read the bolded part together. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? So we'll stop there for a second. So the level of detail here, I think, is really important in our, uh, our understanding of why we're saying all this stuff, right? Um, if you say you believe this, people will know specifically, like, where, what your faith is in, right? You can't, you can't, they can't get you confused with somebody else because of the specificity of your confession here. Um, you're confessing in the virgin birth. Um, you're confessing that even though Jesus was the son of God, he suffered at the hands of men and not just any men, but a particular man, which identifies this as a historical statement as well, that Pontius Pilate was a person in history. And so this happened in history, um, that he died. So when you say this, you're claiming that, that Jesus, true God and true man died and was buried. He didn't pretend to die, he died. 
and descended into hell, right? So, and that's the recognition that he took upon himself the penalty meant for us in our sin, right? That's what we deserve. Uh, but hell could not keep him. Third day, he rose from the dead. So we're professing faith in the resurrection. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. Now, the right hand is the, sig the signifier of his now authority, right? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Um, and then that he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. So all of that is packed into that little paragraph. <clears throat> so Luther, what does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. So Luther really takes opportunity here, as you remember his historical context is he's really pushing against the idea that you have to do stuff in order for your salvation to be enacted through Jesus, right? And here, the actor and the, the actor <laughs> and the, uh, the subject of all of the sentences in the meaning is not us, it's God, right? And Jesus is doing this stuff to us. Um, who has redeemed me a lost condemned person? Purchased and won all of the, the subject of all those verbs is Jesus. Um, and, uh, and why does he do that? that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness and blessings. He loves you. He wants you to be a part of his family. He wants to have you in eternity with him. Okay. Um, so here, I'll just give you a little, before we end for today, um, we'll go, we'll finish this up to letter B here on page 16. Uh, I'm just going to give you the summaries of what are in these scripture references. And if you want to go on and read them, I would encourage you to do so. So Matthew 16, 13 to 17 is Peter's confession of faith in Jesus. So that's when, when, uh, when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And he says, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for my father has revealed, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now the Catholic understanding of that that passage is the rock refers to peter and we say that the rock refers to a confession that peter made so the, the rock of the church is that christ is the son of the living god okay. because grammatically it can refer to either and we would say it doesn't make sense it doesn't seem consistent with the rest of the gospel teaching that he would place a regular human person in a role like and so we interpret that as referring to the confession. Uh, Philippians 2, 9, 11, uh, that he is, his name is exalted and placed above name above every name. Um, Acts 4, verse 12, is salvation in him alone. Uh, John chapter 1, that's the, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God. Right? Uh, and that's the word made flesh section. So Jesus is the incarnate word of God, the word made flesh. And then um, 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6 is where it identifies that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. And so that's speaking against the idea that like we don't pray to saints. That's why we don't pray to saints. We believe the scriptures say that there's only one mediator between us and God. There's only one person speaking on our behalf to God, and that's Jesus. Uh, and then the two natures of Christ, you may have already filled that out. That's true God and true man. So we believe that he has 100% of both natures. Now you can see why that would have been the source of most of the early church controversy. because That's hard to logically wrap your brain around. Okay, that's where we'll stop today. We'll finish this up uh, next week. Like I said, there's some... Uh, there's some appendix in the back um, where Luke, there's some section where Luther writes on the creeds, and then um, there's some stuff from the church calendar on the very back page. Uh, you have the season of incarnation, the time of Christmas, and they talk about some of the, the reasons we have those. Um, they reflect the nature of the creeds, right? The incarnation, redemption, 
um, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, all that good stuff. Any last questions before we close for today? I know it's kind of, I know, I know it's kind of a whirlwind um, and, and please feel free. Like, like I said before, don't feel bad about interrupting um, because I like, I do want you to ask questions, especially if there are things you're really curious about. Uh, I, I am giving you like a, a really quick overview. There's a lot more to this. Um, and if you're interested in that, I think I'm probably going to be resuming the study with the videos that are online that I started in the spring. Um, so there'll be opportunity for that. But I wanted to give you this just in case like we don't cover some of the stuff in class, you have, you have something you can use to look at. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and that through your word, you have revealed so much of yourself to us. Not just that you created all things, but that you care for your creation, that you daily sustain it and that you daily sustain us and that you ultimately have sustained us through sending Jesus and all of the things that he did that we confess to believe in the creeds. Continue to be with us in this class as we delve deeper into your word and the teachings of your church, and may that strengthen and enliven our faith in you and help us come to a better understanding and knowledge of the truth, which is that you love us, that you sent your son to die on the cross, and because of that, you declare us forgiven children of God who now have life forever with you to look forward to. Be with these people this week as they go about their daily task of living out their faith garden and protect them from the assaults of the world and the devil and their own sinful flesh and bring them back here to worship you next Sunday. All these things I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week.